The Death Star has been destroyed. The Empire is in ruins, but the dark side lives on. Luke Skywalker, Princess Leia, Han Solo, and the Rebel Alliance have fought valiantly against the evil Galactic Empire. Together, they have kept alive the hopes for freedom and helped restore the ways of the Old Republic with its wise Senate and noble line of Jedi Knights. But now, a new threat awaits the Alliance. Within the evil Empire, the surviving Imperial warlords have been fighting amongst themselves for power. No one knows who will seize control, but the prophets of the dark side have foretold that soon a new emperor will arise, and on his right hand he shall wear an indestructible symbol of evil. where we dive deep into the Jedi Temple Archive and explore the many junior Star Wars novels in the galaxy. I am, of course, Assistant Librarian Levi Peretic, and with me, as always, is the assist- my Assistant Librarian, Tim May. Tim May, dark greetings. How are you today? I bid you dark greetings. This is Tim. I We have a very different episode for you today. We've been reading the Jedi Apprentice series by Jude Watson, and this is our first departure. We have a very different type of book uh, in every way possible. So I'm very excited yes. uh, <laughs> to share this <laughs> great joy with you. <laughs> uh, we, uh, <laughs> how are you doing? I'm doing good. I've been uh, I'm hanging in there. I've been watching Clone Wars. Oh, exciting. Exciting. I hope... Yes. Uh, I, where are you at? Are you in the middle of season one? Well, I'm. I, I, yeah, I'm halfway through season one. I think the last episode I just watched was the one where um, uh, Kit Fisto gets trapped inside General Grievous's lair, um, uh, and I I thought that was actually a kind of a, a, an effective episode in terms of it was kind of like a, a horror movie with General Grievous. Up until this point, I found General Grievous kind of annoying, uh, but I felt like he was effective in this episode. Uh, and the droids, there is so much droid humor, and they are it is so hit or miss with the droids. Yeah, the first season's very hit or miss overall. I don't think there were... Mm-hmm a ton of really great episodes until season two, but there's, there's some strong ones. Surprisingly, like I don't, I didn't think I'd care about the clones at all, but the clone episode in season one, I think it's like the fifth episode is pretty good. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that stuff, I mean, Rex especially is becomes a super interesting character. Um, but yes. enough about this 10 year old program that you should have watched 10 years ago. I know. <laughs> uh, we have a guest today, our very first guest on the podcast. Uh, he's a friend of the show. He's asked questions before. And uh, he's also yes. my brother. Uh, please welcome Dan May. Hey. Uh, how, how are you, you Dan? Oh, I'm well. And yourself? Oh, I'm doing great. So, uh, you know, you and I obviously grew up together, and we both have a deep, deep love of Star Wars. Uh we both have read Star Wars books basically our whole life of some some variety. But you and I, this show is about junior novels. But you and I, even when we were small children, mostly didn't read the junior novels. We thought we were too adult. Grown. We were grown up. We were groans. Groans. Wrong, <laughs> wrong kid phrase. Uh, uh, but we would read, you know, we loved like the X-Wing novels and all the Bantam era, like 90s. A, quote unquote adult Star Wars novels were our jam. So, uh, and you uh, d- 
during uh, grad school, when you were in grad school a few years ago, you took this to another level and you started kind of almost a precursor to this podcast, a, a Star yep. Wars book blog where you reviewed Star Wars novels. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? What was the blog called? Sure. It was called The Stolen Data Tapes, which, is, of course, is uh, taken from uh, Admiral Mahdi's lines in A New Hope uh, regarding the conjuring of said stolen data tapes that can't be done by the wizardry of Darth Vader right before he's choked out. But I uh, started it kind of as a lark. I hadn't been reading Star Wars books in a while, and uh, it had uh, even been a while since my last spurt of uh, Star Wars obsession. But I, I just kind of decided to do it. I believe it was over a discussion with you and another friend of ours over Chinese food, and I, um, I came up with the idea, and uh, I started with a review of, uh, I believe it was Tales from Mos Eisley Cantina, and so I would do a book a week every week on uh, Fridays, and uh, I garnered something like a couple hundred followers who read it every week, and we'd talk about Star Wars books, and it was a good time for a while. Grad school got to be a little bit too intense. I started my student teaching, and I didn't really have enough time for it anymore. That was uh, it was a fun uh, blog, and I remember there was a brief period where you and I were writing reviews together for the last Dark Horse Star Wars like series that was like just called Star Wars, and it was also like set between New Hope and Empire. Yeah, it was not that great. It was okay. But we, we wrote, like, back-and-forth reviews where we would ask each other questions. It would be like, Tim, blah, 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 what did you think about that? It's terrible. Yeah. This dumb element or this good element. And you would respond. And that was a fun time, that little cross back-and-forth. It was like a transcript of a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I miss doing it to an extent. And I... Uh... I remember checking back on it once, and I had, like, one guy in my message inbox, like, hey, what do you think of the new movies? <laughs> and that was about it. But That's fun. Yeah. Did you respond to it? Yeah, I did, of course. So, the real question, the true question to test your fandom. Oh, God. What do you think of the new movies? Yay or nay? It cannot be one or the other. Yeah, only a Sith deals in absolutes. <laughs> <laughs> there's a you know it's it, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that i think that you know i there's a lot there's a lot of the new expanded universe that i like and there's some of it that is you know not so great but you know nothing to die on a hill over exactly i mean the you you bring up the new expanded universe of course the expanded universe refers generally to the old books and comics and video games but you and i None of this stuff is George Lucas. It's all expanding right. universe, the new stuff. And that's not a huge shot at these movies, but they're fun. And we talked about that a little bit on our first episode, me and uh, Levi. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to get Levi into this a little bit, because uh, we haven't really talked that much about our history with Star Wars literature in a general sense. Uh, what? No, we haven't. What kind of uh, Star Wars books did you read when you were young? Did you read the kinds of books we're talking about on the show, or were you more like the quote-unquote adult books? Well, um, let's see. Uh, I know the first book that I've actually read, uh, first Star Wars book I actually read, because um, it was showed up at my elementary school library, and it was book four in this series, Mission to Mount Yoda. Oh, that's the and, series uh, we're beginning coverage of this week? Yeah, yeah, and a fun factoid, I was the first person in the school to to uh, take the book out of the library. I was the first one to read it. Um, so that actually that is the first Star Wars book. That just means you're in a school book. full of losers, Levi. I agree, <laughs> I agree. They had no other Star Wars books other than Mission of Mount Yoda, which if Glove of Darth Vader is any indication, it was a deeply flawed book that I do not remember. Spoilers, um, stop talking! <laughs> Okay, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, other books that I do remember reading are um, 
uh, Splinters of the Mind's Eye, uh, Shadows of the Empire, some of those like super accessible, well-known uh, expanded universe novels. Um, I did try to get into uh, New Jedi Order uh, when it was starting out. I know I read Vector Prime and then f- oddly jumped to Agents of Chaos because I thought it had a cool cover with Han Solo. Um, that's but uh, that's probably about it in terms of the novels that I got into. Oh, wow. Yeah, like we read everything. We read all kinds of Bantam books, the pre-New Jedi Order, the pre-Del Rey license. So we would read, Mm -hmm. you know, obviously the Timothy Zahn novels, but also like uh, X-Wing, the Michael A. Stackpole uh, novels about Wedge Antilles and Rogue Squadron. And uh, those are some of our favorites, I think. I I love the... uh, I loved those tales from the Maul's Eisley Cantina, tales of the bounty hunters, tales from Jabba's palace. All those short story collections were so much fun. I was so frustrated when the prequels came out that they never did like tales of the pod racers, tales from Dex's diner, you know, it, it's, just, they it's honestly a disgrace. They kind of tried to bring it back with last Jedi, the, the, like this Canto bite thing, but there are only four stories. It's not like hmm. there were like 20 stories, like 16 to 20 stories yeah, in yeah, these yeah, old that's... books. And so it's just like four like short novellas, and like they all lead up to the to the movie. I uh, I would have liked to see them do that a little more, uh, yeah, blow that I more agree. out. But I didn't read that book, so I don't want to say too much about that. Uh, <laughs> but what was Tell us your from the history? Pod racer would... the, what about the Tales from the pod, uh, from the Pod Racers would have been so good. Yeah, Ben Quadraneros needs his. <laughs> Story told. Gascano. Gascano has always been my boy. Gascano finished number two in the Bunta Eve classic. True. Gas- Gascano is like a true. He's like a Hall of Famer. Like it's like Charles Barkley never won a championship, but that's just because he played when <laughs> when my Michael Jordan was playing. Like it's the same exactly. thing. Exactly. Anakin just because Anakin was in that race doesn't mean Gascano can't you know. <laughs> Can't get it, you know. Exactly, he was going to place. He was going to be second no matter what happened. I mean, let's be perfectly honest. So, so uh, but, uh, what, Dan? Yes. I, w- I want to uh, because let's turn it in back onto our show. What is your kind of experience with this particular demographic of Star Wars novel? Young readers, we're talking like age six to twelve, long-ish series, but of like hundred and ten page novels. Uh, goosebumps level <laughs> reading. What is your experience? What have you? Re- what did you read when you were that age? What do you have? What have you read since? Okay. I uh, well, not a lot actually. Like you pointed out, when I was a kid, I went straight to like the quote unquote grown up books. You know, so uh, like the first Star Wars book I ever read was The Truce at Bakura because I picked it up because it took place directly after Return of the Jedi. When the book we're covering today also takes yes. place. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, more on that in a bit. I uh, because I have some stuff to say about that. But regardless. Um, so I didn't read a lot of that uh, young reader stuff. I do remember one time I took out of my elementary school library a it was like an Empire Strikes Back Choose Your Own Adventure book where like you were like a self insert character tagging along with Luke like trying to become a Jedi. Like this you, sounds fascinating. Yeah, like you're with Luke on Dagobah and. Like, the, the thing that pissed me off the most in that book, though, was, like, you have a vision in the cave, too, but it's just a bunch of stormtroopers because, you know, they don't know you and they can't come up with a unique fear for you to have. Well, that's why we need the AI to come and take over our life. Terrifying. They, then they'll be able to read our minds. <laughs> All right. But, yeah, I, other than that, you know what? Oh, it's I fun- read uh, the first book in the series you're doing on your normal episodes, the uh, Jedi Apprentice books. I read the first one of those when I was around when it came out and I liked it. I just didn't pursue that. And I'm actually in the process of rereading that now since you guys have been talking about it. So you can follow along, follow along with our great, great podcast. (laughs) Uh, I agree. And those books are amazing. These books are, the Jedi, I will say, the Je- Jedi Apprentice rules. This book that we read this week has really put that in true 
the stark relief. This the, the Jedi Apprentice books and Jude Watson especially. These books are so fun. I can't wait till next week when we talk about. Mark I know, the Crown. I know. But this week though, we're we're talking about uh, another book, and uh, we'll talk about it when we come back uh, from the break. Hang on, hang on. One thing, real quick. This is an observation I want to make, real quick. Okay. So uh, Dan's a little bit older than you, and of course he jumped into you know more adult Star Wars novels. Um, the book we're reading today is from 92. Are there any junior novels before this? Well, you mentioned that Choose Your Own Adventure. Was that from the 90s, or do you think it was older? I don't know. I, I mean, it was so long ago. I don't know about the copyright date of it. But, um, yeah, I, I this, to my knowledge, and I again, I, my knowledge is not super deep on this, aspect of it even when i did my uh, blog i explicitly decided not to cover any junior novels just because i was trying to read everything and it would be too involved but in any case um the choose your adventure book i'm not sure but as far as i know the glove of darth vader is the earliest ya book and i actually deliberately avoided it because i knew the premise of it and it seemed really dumb well we'll get to that after the break but I, I also, over the break, I'm going to look up this Choose Your Own Adventure book, because I think it's important that we address this. Because <laughs> uh, I don't even remember this. Dan is a little bit older than me, and but we have very, pretty similar experiences as Star Wars fans, because I think we got really got heavily into it around the same time. Like, even though he was a few years older, he wasn't super into it that long before me. Yeah, that's true. So he was hi- he was reading at a higher grade level though. Yeah, but I was reading I was reading those books a- kind of around the same time. Like he was reading more of them, but I would still read some of them. Like I, I read Truce of Bakura okay. in the late nineties when I was like seven or eight. Uh, you know, get over it, Levi. Some of us read before this year. <laughs> <laughs> Too true. All right, we'll be back after the break. Got a great comic for you tonight, folks. All the way from Findar, one of the fabulous Deirdre brothers. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Guerrera Deirdre! So I was at the cantina last night. I was a little bit drunk. Not so, not so, I lie. <laughs> so anyway, I meet this beautiful Findian woman. Okay. She tells me she's looking for the love of her life. First I tell her I love her to the end of time. She's giving me moon eyes. What do I say next? Not so. That's right. I told her to go get the nude! <laughs> Welcome back to Padawan Library. I'm Tim. I'm here with Levi and my brother Dan, our first guest. And before we get started, I need to address the elephant in the room about the Empire Strikes Back Choose Your Own Adventure novel that my brother claims to have read in the 1990s. He probably did read it in the 1990s, but much later than he might have thought, because the only Choose Your Own Adventure Empire Strikes Back novel I could find any evidence of on the entire World Wide Web was from 1998. It was written by Christopher Golden, who also wrote one for A New Hope and for Return of the Jedi, seemingly as a tie-in to the special edition re-release, although it used kind of the same design elements of the 1995 VHS release. I found that interesting. That's just all I had to address that. I know the listeners during the break were like, they better talk about that Empire Strikes Back Choose Your Own Adventure novel, or I am unsubscribing from this podcast. All right, (laughs) so... (laughs) We have returned. Uh, We're taking a break from the great Jedi Apprentice novels by Jude Watson that we've been liking better and better each time. We're having such a good time with them. I can't, we can't wait for next week, uh, especially after what we read this week, which is the first novel in a sextet of novels, largely colloquially known as, 
the Jedi Prince series, six novels, and uh, they're by uh, Paul and Hollis Davids, a married couple. The first novel is uh, <laughs> is The Glove of Darth Vader. It was published in 1992. And these books kind of hold an interesting place in the old canon, the Legends timeline, if you will. They basically don't exist. It's one of the only things that was completely just written off. Like, the Marvel comics have some contradictions, but they were used, elements of them were always used in, like, later stuff. But these books, which take place right after Return of the Jedi, were so despised by the rest of kind of the people making Star Wars books that they just ignored them, basically, <laughs> almost entirely. They're not even referenced. I have a book by uh, the great Pablo Hidalgo that was published shortly kind of before the Disney sale. It's, kind of, it's called Star Wars The Essential Reader's Companion. It features uh, lots of... Uh, it features, like, profiles of each book and there's a little sidebar about this series because it's not part of the continuity. Incidentally, I got this book as a Christmas present from my mother while I was doing the Star Wars blog. Yeah, it's a, it's a phenomenal <laughs> book. Yeah. It's really a great book. So, uh, But I want to read a little bit of what Pablo uh, Hidalgo has to say uh, in the spotlight column in the book. Uh, and then we'll get started on the review and we'll talk about the authors a little bit. Uh <laughs> So listen to this. Spotlight, Adventures of a Jedi Prince. Illustrated children's books fall outside the scope of this reader's companion, but the six books published by Bantam Skylark from 1992 to 1993 deserve a special mention. Written by Paul Davids and Hollis Davids, with interior art by Carl Kessel and covers by Drew Struzan, the series chronicles the story of Kent, a 12-year-old Jedi prince raised by droids in the underground lost city of the Jedi on Yavin 4. We haven't gotten to that part yet. No, we have not. <laughs> a hitherto unrevealed subterranean layer of advanced technology. Ken has adventures alongside the Star Wars heroes Luke, Han, Leia, Chewbacca, and the droids while facing new villains like the three-eyed Imperial slave master Tri- Trioculus or Jabba the Hutt's bearded father Zorba. Can't wait. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> geared towards younger readers, the stories are whimsical and often out- outlandish particularly when compared with the timber of the surrounding expanded universe. Highlights include Imperials scrambling to recover the indestructible glove of Darth Vader to ensure the rule of the Empire. Uh, some spoilers here coming up that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and Han and Leia marrying each other earlier in the timeline than the Union depicted in the courtship of Princess Leia uh, in 1994. Uh, nonetheless... The events of these stories were cited in reference books such as A Guide to the Star Wars Universe, 2nd Edition, 1994, The Star Wars Encyclopedia, 1998, and The Essential Chronology, 2000, and are, for the most part, considered to have happened within continuity, though perhaps the specifics of their occurrences differ in tone and detail. Whereas some elements, including a rebel base on Dagobah called Mount Yoda, the Lost City, and indeed the central characters of Ken and Triclops have been forgotten in storytelling, other aspects, most notably the shadowy cult of the prophets of the dark side, continue to play active roles in the expanding Star Wars story. This was written before the Disney set, so they do not, they no longer do, but they were in 2012. So yeah, that's, th- those are the general, that's the general consensus on the book. What do you think about that, Levi? Here's what I have to say about this book. If Jude Watson is Mozart, then Paul Davis... Paul and Hollis Davids are Gary Glitter. Oh, well, let's not com- let's not compare them to Gary Glitter. Okay, Carrot Top. Okay, that's better. K- Gary Glitter, like Sorry. that's that's a, that's a serious comparison. That's true. <laughs> that's true. That's very true. So yeah, no, I listen. These uh, these books are very goofy. They're not really in continuity, although some elements of them were kept around throughout the Legends era. Um, but they were largely a joke. I remember always laughing at the name, the Glove of Darth Vader, and the premise of this book uh, when I would see it in my school library. I never read it for that reason. I just thought, this idea is silly. So these books were written by Paul and Hollis Davids, a married couple, and you have a, apparently a lot of information on them. So yes, I want to yes, hear I do. all of it. All of it I want to hear. Okay. 
Paul and Hollis Davids met in 1971 in Cambridge following a screening of George Lucas's THX 1138. It's as if fate had personally selected them to carry on the Skywalker legacy long before J.J. Abrams. <laughs> In their 48 years together, the two of them have produced seven books, only one of them non-Star Wars related, and it was their first book entire, entitled The Fires of Pele, Mark Twain's Legendary Lost Journal, in which Mark Twain travels to Hawaii and meets mythical, legendary Hawaiian creatures. What? <laughs> Why are we reading that? Yep. Th- that sounds fascinating. I it, that's and that was the that was their first book. We may have to do bonus episodes at some point reading other books by these authors. <laughs> this I is, agree. That sounds fascinating. We need to track that down. So weird. Now, according to Paul, I love National Treasure. According to Paul Davids on his personal website, he claims that George personally selected them to write these books that it was it was george's decision i found no other evidence of this but he claims that it was because of that book and his work on the television show transformers that george felt they were qualified to write these books my guess is someone at lucasfilm was like oh it's a transformers writer whatever like i'm sure george had more approval or wanted to approve more at this stage because this is the early going of kind of bringing Star Wars back with, like, Dark Empire, Dark Horse Comics, and the and Heir to the Empire, the Timothy Zahn novel. Mm-hmm. This was the first kind of young reader's venture of that era, at least, although we think it might be the first ever. Um, right. So I'm sure to some degree he had some, like, right of refusal, but probably, so, like, one of his assistants were like, no, they wrote, like, a book about Mark Twain having adventures, and uh, and the one guy he wrote for Transformers, so he knows like kids sci-fi. And George was probably like, "Okay, <laughs> all right." Like Sounds that good. is probably it. I doubt that he picked them specifically, but uh, you know, I shouldn't. Who knows? You know, Paul might be telling the truth. Yeah, who knows? I, I, so the the I love that the you two of them to have. Do... A uh, George, an attempt at a George Lucas voice, just to say the word "okay." I don't have a George Lucas <laughs> voice. I just do the one that everybody else does. It doesn't sound anything like him. the The typical George Are Lucas you kidding voice me? is so far from his actual voice. It's very strange to me. People just think he mumbles everything, which is just not even true. But whatever. Uh, <laughs> All right. So the two of them have two children together. And at the time of this book being published, and this is according to the about the authors, at the time of this book being published, Hollis was the VP of special projects at Universal Pictures. And that job entitled her coordinating studio premieres and Academy Award uh, campaigns. Now, Hollis does not currently put herself out there on the world wide web quite like paul does paul has at least i found three personal websites dedicated to his many crafts he is a true renaissance man writer director producer painter documentarian and a musician now, a little bit of background information about Paul, because he puts this all out there. <laughs> Paul, okay, he's, as a teenager, he was a classic teenage filmmaker who made silent movies on 8mm. And when he was still in high school, Famous Monsters, the magazine, dedicated an entire article to him and his his movie making. So it was like they were like putting him out there as this guy is going to be huge. He's the original. From, he's like Don Glut, who wrote the Empire Strikes Back novelization. He was a friend of George's from film school. They do not like each other anymore. <laughs> um, but the uh, so, but he's actually a famous like he was a famous teenage filmmaker. There's actually a pretty fun documentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So from there, Paul went to Princeton, where he claims to be the only student in the history of the school to win all three major student writing awards in one year. Oh, boy, I don't know. Shocking. <laughs> shocking after this book. All right. Afterwards, he studied film at... He went to study film at the American Film Institute, where he was in the school. same class as... He was in the same class as Paul Schrader. <laughs> the two great Pauls. Oh, and, Schrader. And there is, Paul and there's a photo what of him Paul, and Paul together. Wait, what was Paul Schrader doing in 1992? I think he had a movie. I'm going to look this up. Keep talking. Okay, definitely look it up. Favorite, um, okay, bad. so um, his Paul's uh, so not Paul Schrader, Paul Davids. His first major film credit was uh, for writing the 1981 documentary "She Dances Alone," the documentary of a Russian dancer, which features Max von Sydow, Force Awakens alumni. <laughs> of course, that is his. Sho- shocking, am I right? Come on. Um, he later went so many connections he later I know he later went on to be the production coordinator on 80 episodes of Transformers and in 1994 this is probably what he's most famous for he executive produced and he claims to have co-written but he only gets a story by credit on this on IMDB the Showtime TV movie Roswell starring Kyle MacLachlan and Martin Sheen have you seen this this movie movie before I haven't seen okay. it, but I've seen I've the s- tape around and stuff. So, mm-hmm. I've seen the movie. It's okay. Um, it's a pretty. It's like historically accurate about like the Roswell incident, what happened, um, and it's it's pretty interesting. It's it's a it's a fun watch. It's probably too long of a movie, but it is fun. Well, now, I, I actually I'm gonna... I'll say this about the book: the, some of the really bad writing reads like screenplay stuff to me. Like it's like. The okay. kind of very literal uh, description that you would write in a screenplay because nobody's going to see that writing. You know what I mean? Exactly. So, yep. He could be a decent screenwriter, yep. uh, I guess. Yes. <laughs> so, um, jumping present day, he's done a whole slew of documentaries. Um, he's done... Um, a Van Gogh documentary, a book called um, documentary called "The Sci-Fi Boys," which he actually won a Saturn Award for. Um, Jesus in India, um, and then he has a two-part documentary called "Life After Death Project," in which he claims after the de- the the founder of Famous Monsters, uh, after he died, communicated with him beyond the grave. Crazy. Um, and the whole the whole documentary is about that. <laughs> now, here's what I need you to do i need you to get on your web browser and i need you to search well type in hackharddrive.com what is it hack hard drive yes all one word H-K? dot com c k okay h a r d d r i v e okay yeah dot com dot com Loading, loading. Okay. Oh boy. Professor Hack Hard Drive, the satirical this is the, poet it, of our time, a voice of that, sanity, ladies and gentlemen, crying out in a technological wilderness. That the man you are looking at, Professor Hack Hard Drive, is also known as Paul Davids. Oh my God. This is a YouTube series in which he claims to be a poet and musician. On the website, you'll see he claims that he makes videos weekly. Um, he posted for only two years. Um, he had, and those were five years ago. Um, and also, if you look on the homepage, you may see a quote that he wrote himself. Not since the parodies of Weird Al Yankovic or a song like They're Coming to Take Me Away or The Monster Mash has there been this much madness in song and verse. Oh my god, this is, uh, <laughs> let's hear a song. Oh boy. Well. Listen to, if you're, okay, if you're going to watch any video, l- either watch Airport Security or You're Thinner, You're Fatter. We're going to check Airport out. Airport Security. 
We're gonna check out airport security. Okay, mm. that's a po. It's one of his poem videos. You're thinner, you're fatter is a song. Oh, uh, let's check out the song. Oh no, this looks <laughs> unfortunate. <laughs> okay, we're gonna we're gonna play the song. Uh, I'll drop okay. it in later so the audience can hear it clearly. Okay. Oh, it's four minutes. We deal with diets in many ways in our lives and keeping trim and keeping our weight proper. Some of us are thin, some of us are fat, and others of us vacillate between the two, thinner, fatter, thinner, fatter. And so here is Professor Hackard Drives. You're thinner. You're fatter. You're thinner. You're fatter. You're fatter. You're thinner. You're thinner. You're fatter. You're fatter. You're fatter. You're thinner. You're thinner. You're thinner. You're fatter. You're thinner. You're fatter. You're thinner, much thinner. That's really good news. Your old clothes now fit you. Say goodbye to the blues. Congratulations, my friend. You're the picture of health. You've achieved something better than wealth. You've lost 30 pounds and you look so thin. You've even lost that double chin. Uh, Your diet's no, a smash. Count cal- <laughs> We're going to move on from this. Uh, anything else you found out about Paul Davis? <laughs> no, no, that's all. That is all. This is, so, uh, okay, uh, so Professor Hack Hard Drive and his wife and his, and his poor wife, Hollis, <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they wrote The Glove of Darth Vader. Um, I will say his, his, uh, his classmate from uh, the AFI Film Institute, Paul Schrader, in 1992, when he was writing, uh, the, when Paul Davids was writing The Glove of Darth Vader, uh, Paul Schrader put out <laughs> Light Sleeper, the classic, uh, his classic film with Willem Dafoe and Susan Sarandon, uh, an iconic part, <laughs> iconic film from his career. Uh, so they were, they were working on the same level by 92. Uh, yes, they were. All right, so let's get into the book. Uh, this book, oh boy! So the book kind of opens. Uh, it opens with like a prologue that's like kind of a an attempt at an opening crawl that says like the adventure continues, and it recaps the trilogy in like pretty ridiculously long winded fashion. Like, and and it's it's not like based on the style of the opening crawls at all. But like, skipping over many key details, considering how exhaustive an account it is. Yeah, it's it's baffling. So it also kind of sets up the story. It mentions at the end, the prophets of the dark side have foretold that a new emperor shall rise wearing the glove of Darth Vader. <laughs> so <laughs> it jumps into chapter one. And the droids, C-3PO and R2-D2, um, the chapter one is called Droids on a Mission. And so Luke is preparing 3PO and R2 for a mission to Kessel of Spice Mine fame. And uh, they're still on Yavin 4. They've, they've returned to Yavin 4, which is apparent in these books is apparently like the main rebel base like still even though they had left but you haven't four in the movies but i can see why they might think that that's not the worst of this book's problems um so <laughs> they uh he, he's replacing c-3po's head with a green kessel droid head so that he can go undercover on the spy mission that they're prepping him for um they head uh and 3 is of course complaining the whole time uh but they head over to the new senate building to hear Mon Mothma's briefing on the mission, um, the uh, it, it, all the key members of SPIN, the Senate's Planetary Intelligence Network, will be there. A, some sort of secret organization. The fact that it's called SPIN, they they kind of do covert missions, and they love the band Pavement. Um, <laughs> so. And who and the key members of Spin are Luke Skywalker, yes. Han Solo, Princess Leia, Admiral Akbar, Mon Mothma, Lando Calrissian, Chewbacca, and the droids. There doesn't seem to be anybody else in this secret group. That's yes, that's true. I was just getting to that. <laughs> um, so, um, so the Senate 
uh, palace is in the palace of Woolamander, and present there is basically every member of Spin. Mon Mothma, Leia, Han, Lando, Chewbacca, and Akbar, referred to <laughs> endlessly in this book as a fish man. <laughs> so, so uh, Han, like, compliments Luke on 3PO's... I w- uh, we, I want to read this. Surgery. I want to read this real quick okay. because this is so poorly written. Well, kid, Han said to Luke, you sure did a great job on these droids. If I didn't know what was going on, I'd swear I was in Kessel. Thanks, Han. Coming from you, that really <laughs> means a lot, Luke said to his friend. Yeah, I. that whole section <laughs> is baffling. All right, yeah, and then the funniest part to me is in the next paragraph... Han begins, you know, Kessel is a planet that all experienced cargo pilots try to avoid, said Han, especially me. But a few times, when there was a fortune to be made from transporting spice, I flew the trip from Kessel anyway, against my better judgment. In fact, I've made the Kessel run in the Millennium Falcon in less than 12 standard time parts. You told me that the day I first met you, back in the cantina at the Moss Eisley spaceport on Tatooine, said Luke. Remember when I showed up with Obi-Wan Kenobi and... Yeah, I remember, kid. Now that you mention it, interrupted Han, he knitted his brows and frowned. Well, take my word for it, things have gotten even meaner on Kessel since then. So, (laughs) this... This is, first of all, just hilarious writing. I love that Luke's like, remember this specific conversation? You told me that when we first met. Uh, this is very funny to me. But even funnier is the fact that they're like, ah, parsec is not a unit of time. It's a unit of measurement. I'm a generic nerd. I'm Neil deGrasse Tyson. Me. <laughs> um, it's like, guess what? He said parsec. Just say parsec, you losers. So anyway... Uh, Kessel's, you know, meaner or whatever since New Hope, apparently. Uh, <laughs> thousands of Imperials, and Mon Mothma gets up there, thousands of Imperials and other sympathizers are arriving on Kessel. R2 is loaded up with info on all these motherfuckers, possible, like, new emperors, data on the prophets of the dark side that they mentioned in the opening, uh, you know, and the supreme prophet, Kadan. And Kadan has a controversial new po- prophecy. And I'm going to read this the way it's written. It's written like it's a poem or something. Oh, boy. So, here we go. After Palpatine's fiery death, another leader soon comes to command the Empire. And on his right hand, he does wear the glove of Darth Vader. The glove of Darth Vader. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> find out the poets of the dark side. <laughs> this is just embarrassing. Like, don't they know like basic meter? No. Like, they're pro- these are professional writers, or at least Paul is. Like, this is ridiculous. That, that was the moment. That was the first moment that I put the book down. <laughs> <laughs> And this is even funnier. Right after this, Mon Mothma, you know, she's like, well, you know, she clarifies something. Unlike the left-hand glove, the right glove was made to be indestructible. So, (laughs) one, it's stupid that the glove was made to be indestructible. Yeah, why? Second of all, the fact that she's like, well, of course it's common knowledge that the left glove is destructible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but the right glove, just so you know, it's not the same as the very famous left glove. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the glove, you know, it it's, hasn't been found yet. So they're kind of, you know, uh, you know, racing against time. You know, Ak- Akbar is apparently is apparently an incredible engineer, and he made like an asteroid looking landing pod for R two and three PO that they're going to use to land on Kessel, and. You know, Lando comes, is like, oh, I need to be dropped off on Bespin on the way there because he's like, I'm ready to, you know, take back my control of the city. You know, the war's basically over. Um, Han, you know, then Han takes Leia aside. This is this is this is the best. And can I read Leia? Yeah, you can read Leia. 
Uh, we're going to get started here in a minute here, but on page, uh, page nine or no, yeah, 10, sorry, or nine and 10. So Han goes up to Leia and I, before we get started, I just want to say he calls her your highness in a totally sincere way in this exchange. And while, yeah, okay, maybe that's like, oh, we're reflecting his growth. And it's just he, it's not something he would call her without kind of making fun of it. So, th- whatever. Anyway, here we go. Under the starlit sky of Yavin 4, Han Solo walked Princess Leia to her quarters. Your Highness, said Han, after Chewie and I drop off the droids in the meteor pod on Kessel and take Lando back to Cloud City, well, I don't know exactly how to put this. I'm not planning on coming back for a while. But Han... Leia protested. You know how important you are to spin. Maybe so, but Lando's offering me a lease on a piece of sky near Cloud City. I've always dreamed of having a place of my own, and I figure it's about time Chewie and I built my dream sky house. (laughs) Can't you put it off until we know what's going on with the new Emperor? asked Leia. Princess, there's always something important that seems to come up before I can take care of my own dreams. My dream sky house, that is. Time is running out, and a man's got to do what he's got to do. <laughs> if if that's the way you want it, Han, Leia said, not quite understanding him, she turned away. I'm going to miss you, princess, said Han, taking her hand. May the force be with you. It'll always be with me in my dream sky house. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> that's not what it actually says, was it? No, it doesn't say that. I, I added the extra mentions the dream sky house. Of course, she doesn't quite understand him. <laughs> this is not the same man. He's a completely different this human He's a totally being. different man. What? What is... Okay. What? Han? Okay, if, if Han's going to get flaky, <laughs> it's not to settle down by himself in his dream sky house. Yeah, what the fuck? I can say that, right? Yeah, yeah, you're fine. And, uh, <laughs> it's tr- and you know what? This whole dialogue between the two of them, all, almost every line Leia has is all nearly identical to their exchange in Empire Strikes Back when Han is leaving. On Echo Base. Oh, wow. It's it like is. That. Yeah. yeah, it's like, apparently all people that make, or that write uh, stories that take place after Return of the Jedi just cannot fathom the idea that Han and Leia might just, you know, be happy together. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just baffling, you know. So that's basically how the first chapter ends, and this book is already off to a ridiculous start. So. And it's so strange because we won't see Han or Leia pretty much at all for the rest Leia of the time. Leia shows right? up at the very end, but, okay. but Han is, yeah. is not in the book. It's like, they, it, it's like they didn't want those characters in the book. They thought it would clutter up the narrative about the whale people. Well, we'll get to the whale people. <laughs> Let's not get ahead of ourselves. So, moving on to chapter chapter two. Why why don't you take this away, Levi? All right, chapter two, entitled Lightning Power of the Dark Side. (laughs) So, in this chapter, uh, C-3P and R2-D2 get dropped off on Kessel, and their escape pod looks like a meteor. They dressed it so it's like a round meteor so that it doesn't alert the Imperials. And so what's going on here is they are going to the uh, Cassandrian Stadium. I guess there's like a sports stadium on Kessel. And so all the Imperial leaders, all, everybody who's who is going to be there. And they basically need R2-D2 and C-3PO to spy on them. This is the part that made me furious. Because if they know all of these Imperials are going to be there, and if they're going to possibly address who the new emperor is, then why don't they attack the stadium and blow the whole thing to hell? Yeah, it's a bad... Instead, we're going we're gonna to send two droids in, because that's not the new Galactic Senate way. Apparently, they are extreme pacifists. <laughs> Um, so, so anyway, R2-D2 and uh, C-3PO, they go to the stadium, and this is where we meet Grand Moff Hissa. <laughs> and Hissa... 
<laughs> so Hissa is bald with sharp, pointy teeth, and this is he opens he addresses the crowd he gets up to the podium and he opens with i bid you all dark greetings <laughs> so apparently this the these guys are so evil that they acknowledge they're the bad guys so so hissa makes an announcement the, i mean we're all wondering who is the new emperor and hissa reveals that Sheev Palpatine had a son. Oh, a son? And his name is Trioculus. And he's a mutant, and he is the supreme slave lord of Kessel. Supreme Instead of cheering, slave lord. Go on. That's right. Yes. The supreme slave lord leader of Kessel <laughs> and instead of che- instead of cheering the crowd there's a frightened hush because this guy is so bad he is known to be just the most evil person on Kessel and he's evil the reason why he's evil is because when he was a mu- cuz he's a mutant with a third eye in the center of his head when he went to school on Kessel, this uh, apparently he was bullied for having three eyes, and this later turned made him take revenge on all his uh, fellow schoolmates. And the way he took revenge on his schoolmates was by spying on them and then snitching to the teacher all of the kids who are breaking the rules. <laughs> this guy is a dirty little rotten snitch. <laughs> <laughs> He's worthless. I so, Trioculus. Sucks. He is. Trioculus sucks. And it, there's a moment too where like C3PO, uh, I don't have it here in front of me, but like C3PO definitely says something like, "Wait a minute. Sheev Palpatine had like a son and it was with an alien woman?" Like so, And there's actually I you I I'm glad you mentioned that because there's something that C3PO says. Uh, on page 18, <laughs> uh, or he doesn't say it. One second. Here we go. Uh, oh, it I describes... Uh, 3PO could see that Trioculus looked powerful and threatening, but he was surprised that he wasn't ugly like Darth Vader and Emperor Palpatine had been. In fact, <laughs> Trioculus was almost handsome. <laughs> <laughs> so C-3PO is like, Trioculus can get it. <laughs> like, 3 <laughs> just wants to fuck Trioculus. <laughs> this is the facts. Well, canon. Canon. <laughs> canon. Barely. If we're, uh, if, if we're gonna go there, the, the thing that astonishes me the most about this whole plot is that I find it inconceivable that Sheev has any sexual desires whatsoever, malicious or benign. Yeah, I can't imagine she fucking... I agree. Um, I agree So, no, continue. Sorry. <laughs> um, let's see here. So, this, this fucking Trioculus, he thinks he is the, like, the best thing since sliced bread. He says here on page 19, um... My father, the Emperor, had many powers of the dark side, but without three eyes, he could never achieve perfection. It was known by the ancients that a dark lord with three eyes had a secret strength possessed by none other, and so it is my destiny to rule over my father's empire and bring us the glory that he never achieved. And already you can tell this guy, there's something up with this guy. Claiming to be smarter than Sheev? Suspect. <laughs> Sheev is the most intelligent character in the Star Wars universe. There is nobody who can outsmart Sheev. Sheev is the master, the ultimate master manipulator. Yeah, so... He's the best. At, at this point, uh, a guy kind of comes out of the uh, crowd. Uh, what's his name here? Oh, yeah. A gr- a grand moth, a grand admiral. That's the same rank as Thrawn, by the way. Yeah, it's it's baffling. It's not a grand admiral. I'm sorry. A royal guard claims 
that another person is claiming the title of the new emperor, and he has 30 Star Destroyers under his command. And this guy, his name is Grand Admiral Grunger of the planet Gargon. <laughs> I don't want to ever hear anyone shit-talking the names in the prequels ever a fucking again. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. So, so yeah, he claims that Trioculus cannot be the Emperor because he does not have the glove, and... As Trioculus then claims, as the Emperor's son shouted Trioculus, it is through my blood that I roll, and not with some glove. <laughs> and it's at, and then he, and then he shoots Force Lightning out of his hands and strikes this royal guard in the face. The guy falls to his knees, pleading with Trioculus to stop. And uh, so uh, this is interesting here. He shows mercy. He doesn't kill this royal guard. He lets him stay. And yeah, that's... he lets him live. And then from there, people start bowing before Trioculus. And at this point, you know, 3PO and R2, they start to leave, but stormtroopers are locking all the doors. Not that this matters, because they get out of this in one sentence in the next chapter. I'm just... I don't know why I even brought that up. So, moving on to Chapter 3. Um, the Chapter 3 is called The Seven Words of Trioculus. Alright, so Trioculus, he heads back to his palace, which he apparently has a palace, and he's with Grand Moff Hissa and his droid MD-5. Alright? MD-5 handles a lot of stuff here. But, they're having a celebration banquet, and they're eating... Waladon meat, or Waladon... Waladon meat, let's get real. Okay, Waladon meat, which is apparently a delicacy that's reserved typically for uh, high-ranking Imperial officers. And so, uh, they're huge and whale-like creatures, which they're described as whale-like creatures, (laughs) uh, from Calamari, not Mon Calamari, uh, or Mon Cala, which is kind of how it was later uh, described, but just Calamari. This is Akbar's home planet, of course. Uh, it's against the law there to kill these creatures, the Waladons. Um, so that comes back into play later, but during dessert, Trioculus proclaims... <laughs> he proclaims seven words, the, the famous seven words of Trioculus of this, of this title. Find... One, me, two, the, three, glove, four, of, five, Darth, six, Vader, seven. That's seven words. Seven words of trioculus. So, so Hissa commands the Central Committee of Grand Moths to send out probe droids at once in search of the glove. Uh, Grand Moff... Mu- Muzzer, <laughs> who is described as the plumpest and most round-faced of the Grand Moffs, some J.K. Rowling shit here, questions uh, questions this, and like his Hissa shuts him right down. Uh, Trioculus, he asks for like secret base. Suggestions. He's like, well, the Empire has to go underground, and we, we're going to create all these secret bases. And this seems hilarious to me. So, there's a parade of these fucking idiots, these grand moths and a couple grand admirals thrown in for good measure, suggesting different planets. So, one guy, oh my God. Uh, Grand Moth Dunhausen, he suggests Tatooine. Uh, he apparently also wears earrings shaped like blasters, by the way. Very funny. Uh, uh, and he's like, we can take over Moss Eisley! And uh, then uh, Kisselborn uh, suggests Bespin, where, you know, Lando Calrissian, the Alliance hero, is in charge. <laughs> Great idea. Gargan, he suggests Dagobah, which... It's like an out-of-the-way planet that no one's ever heard of. The Empire's never heard of it's it. It's just a catalog of, hey, remember these planets? Exactly. There are, like, no original planets in this book even mentioned. I think there's, like, one mention of a planet that's not mentioned in the movies. Uh, 
Oh, you mean uh, Gungadar or whatever? That yeah, that might have been it. There might have been one other one, but almost every planet that serves any significant role is a planet we've seen before. So then finally Hissa is like, obviously it's got to be Hoth. Echo Base was abandoned by the Rebels, and we can just move right in there, and the Rebels will never think to look back at Echo Base at the end of the war. They might never think to go recover their stuff. <laughs> so anyway... Trioculus is like, yeah, Hoth, man, that makes sense. And so Grand Admiral <laughs> Gargan, he tells Trioculus that he's being too hasty. And he's like, you got to slow down. Like, we don't even know, like, what's going to happen with that other dude. The, 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 what was his name? The goofy guy? The Gargan. Gargan. Gargan? Yeah, Gargan's the planet, I think. It's uh, Grunger. Uh, Grunger. I'm sorry, Grunger, of course. Uh, <laughs> this guy was just reading a lot of Spin Magazine in 1992. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so... That's how we got all that hip music. Yeah. So, his, but then this guy, uh, Gargan, is killed for defying Trioculus. Not by Trioculus. But by Hissa, Hissa's just like, boom, I got you with my blaster. We don't even need to deal with your disobedience. So, meanwhile, we move away from our villains and we move back to our heroes. 3PO and R2, uh, just get out of the stadium somehow. It's, it's like, it's written off, it, like, there's a cliffhanger from the previous chapter that's like, oh no, they're trapped in the stadium. It's just like, oh, they just walked out with the crowd. <laughs> like, Anyway, and but they're lost in the city uh, until they're not, like, a paragraph later. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, R2, for so, uh, on page 29, this is interesting. Uh, on page 29, R2 seems more nervous than C-3PO. Oh, yeah. In this that. moment. Uh, here it is, like... First of all, one problem with any Star Wars book that tries to uh, write out the sounds of Wookiees talking or, or R2, I hate it. Just say they made a noise. I agree. It's and terrible. then have 3PO interpret them or whatever. But anyway, to zoot gazimba, R2 beeped in frustration. <laughs> Calm down, R2. There must be some mistake, said 3PO. We'll find our way. What? That's the reverse. Like, did these guys, these people see these movies? Like, or did they just see them once when they came out and didn't watch them again when they got this job? That's really what I think happened. <laughs> I agree, 100%. <laughs> so, anyway, they, they get out of the city very quickly. Uh... You know, the maps of the city provided by Mon Mothma are, are inaccurate, though. So we don't really know exactly how they got out. But the way we knew they were inaccurate is that apparently uh, the road labeled Spice Mines Avenue is actually now called Slave Lord Boulevard. <laughs> this stuff's nonsense. This is nonsense! <laughs> I feel like that was at least an attempt at a joke. I think it's supposed to be funny, <laughs> but it's, like, not written... <sighs> okay. Anyway, the city's crawling with stormtroopers, but the droids make it out somehow. It's barely described. It's like, oh, they, they just got to the edge of these mountains. <laughs> like, like, you'd think that's, like, a fun opportunity for some sort of little action set piece or intrigue, you know, you know chase scene, whatever. no. They're on the outskirts of the mountains, and a ship that is the, the, the rebels had had stolen like this uh, imperial speeder or something that was going to pick them up, and uh, that model of ship shows up, but it's not the actual model number. R two notices, so it's a real imperial ship, and four of them show up and start chasing him, chasing them, and they have to hide, and they hide behind a rock that's like near their pod that they landed on with, and so. Uh, Luke then just shows up, like, in person to save them, and he, like, but, and apparently they, him and Akbar landed the speeder that they had stolen when they hadn't gotten a signal from the pod, and so uh, they kind of run away, they get to the speeder, Akbar is there, this, this is something actually I kind of want to break, break out and talk about for a second. 
Akbar, okay. Admiral Akbar, yeah. is doing land missions now. Yeah, what the hell? That's ridiculous. <laughs> it's like it's like uh, the Rebel Alliance has like shrunk to Last Jedi sizes. Like there seem to be <laughs> like five to ten people left in the entire alliance. It's truly strange. I don't understand why this is happening. <laughs> anyway, but what a is in there, the fish man, he's endlessly referred to just as fish man, which, you know, it, 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 seems, just, it seems kind of racist. <laughs> I, I, like, it's strange to me because it's like, if you're in the real world, just imagine the equivalent of that. We don't need to go into yeah. it, but it's like, imagine just calling someone your race man <laughs> or, you know, whatever. You know, calling someone black man, like, all the time. That's weird! Anyway. Okay. Uh, so they escape. Chapter four. <laughs> <laughs> they can't go back chapter to Yavin four. 4, so... That's yeah, all I have to chapter say. Chapter four. Endangered Walladons. So this chapter doesn't actually open with the Walladons. We jump back to Trioculus, and Trioculus is steaming fucking mad because he's a little bitch boy who hasn't gotten the glove of Darth Vader yet. And he is so pissed that he has put their move to Hoth on hold. He's he's practically Donald Trump. He can't accomplish anything. Um, so suddenly he gets a message. And this message is from Captain Dunwell. <laughs> and Captain Dunwell is a fisherman on Calamari who hunts Walladons. He's the primary meat supplier. This dude is bad news. Apparently, he's been illegally hunting Walladons on Calamari for years. Why the Mon Calamarans have been unable to do anything about this man is beyond me. So he, of course, says, hey, I found something on Calamari. You better get your britches over here. So Trioculus is like, oh, hell yeah, I'm hopping in the ship. <laughs> so we have a break from Trioculus and we jump to Calamari where we're under the ocean and we can see the great dome <laughs> city of, what is it, a Aquaria? Aquarius. The name of it? It's a straight up Aquarius. Aquarius. The dawning the of the age thereof. Aquarius. Yes. And we meet a Walladon character. His name is Leviathor. <laughs> he is the largest of all the Walladons. Can I, can, can and I stop he for is a the leader Leviathor. of Leviathor. all the Walladons. They don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> He's a sea monster. So he, and Thor is something. <laughs> Leviathor. I don't know. It's very goofy. So um, he is, he is the leader of the Walladons, and uh, he's he's reflecting on the fact that so many of his fellow species have been killed by Captain Dunwell. And in this chapter, he is nearly captured um, by Captain Dunwell's uh, submarine uh, that is this massive sub that just has this big mouth on the front of it, and it literally sucks the Walladons into the ship, like, through, like, water force. Um, what else happens? Oh, they also mention um, that there is a Walladon processing plant. So not only has Captain Dunwell been illegally fishing on Calamari, he has built an illegal meat processing plant on the planet that the Mon Calamarans have done absolutely nothing and about. They know, and Akbar, I, I'm just going to jump ahead slightly. Later on, Akbar knows where it is. It's the same chapter, yeah. So it's like... Yeah. The, the government Again. apparently is totally aware. I mean, I guess this is real life, man. They're aware of all these big businesses <laughs> doing all this shady shit, but they don't do anything about it. Why? <laughs> to keep things status quo, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I use a silly voice, but true. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, anyway, they 
Akbar and Luke, they're afraid probe droids are going to get them. So instead of going back to Yavin 4, they go to Calamari and they're going they're heading to Aquarius when in so the ship they're in also can double as an underwater sub and they they dive into the ocean and they meet Le, 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 Leviathor who sings them a song <laughs> of pain and sorrow and Luke is so moved by this he promises to help them. This information of Trioculus and the Glove of Vader is now second fiddle. We must help the Walladons. Yes, indeed. This is very, like, you know, 1992 is very Save the Whales era, which, by the way, uh, I'm not making fun of. I wish that had worked more <laughs> in real life. Uh, but it's just, a, you know, it's amusing that this kind of pressing time-based issue that's, like, very tight timeline, like, we need to keep the glove of Vader away from this guy is secondary. Um, anyway, so chapter five, Captain Dunwell's discovery, you know, Trioculus, he's headed to Calamari for a, pri- for his, for a private meeting with, Dun- with Dunwell. And, uh, Dunwell greets him saying a most Imperial welcome to you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's better than dark These greetings. losers. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I picked dark greetings to open the show. That's all I'll say. Uh, <laughs> Trioculus, he thinks Dunwell is repulsed by his third eye. He gets a vibe from him. You know, and Dunwell, he, he leads Trioculus and Hissa, who's also there, uh, to uh, his office in the meatpacking plant or whatever to show off. And he, sh- and real- he shows off the entire process the whole way on the way there. And let's talk about the illustration on page 47. There is a Walladon being skinned in this image. This is an extremely graphic image. If this was in color, there'd be blood everywhere. Yes. Yeah, I thought the same thing. I think it's interesting. We should <laughs> maybe take a beat and talk a little bit about the illustrations. The illustrations are uh, pretty goofy. Uh, They're terrible. I hate Luke in them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the pencils are by Benton Jew, uh, and the finished art is by Carl Kessel, who's actually, like, a relatively famous comic book inker. Uh, I think he... I'm trying to blank. I'm, oh, no, not just an inker, but he he worked on... Fantastic Four with Mark Wade and Michael Ringo. I guess he did the fill-in issue. Yeah, I think you're right. Which means that he didn't just get the job because his last name is Kessel. <laughs> so <laughs> now, now in this because they have bios of them and the illustrators in the back of the book. Benton Jew actually worked for ILM, but he started working in 1988. So the movies that he worked for, where he was a storyboard artist, included Ghostbusters Two. <laughs> The Doors, Memoirs of an Invisible Man, and The Hunt for Red October. That's not terrible. I mean, Memoirs is pretty bad. Ghostbusters 2 Ghostbusters is pretty bad. Ghostbusters 2 is eh. But The Doors and, uh, what was the la- and Hunt for Red October, that's not bad. Those are cool yeah. movies. Yeah, well, I mean, he w- but he was just a storyboard artist, so I mean, I could see these being quality storyboards uh, for those, so... Uh, yeah, I, they're not, I don't think they're terrible, but like, there's some dumpy looking faces here, some goofy looking faces. We're gonna post a bunch of them up on our Instagram, so you should check that out and probably Facebook too. So anyway, back to the story, such as it is. <laughs> uh, so Dunwell shows them a chart of like this journey he took to the Valley of the Giant Oysters, the Valley of the <laughs> Giant Oysters. So, uh, when he was last there, he discovered a bunch of debris from an explosion, and he did analysis of it, and it's debris from the second Death Star explosion. Now, oh. uh, <laughs> Calamari is millions of miles away from Endor. Uh, Grandma Pissa is like, well, obviously just some, you know, warp poles opened up or something. It's the most egregious hand-waving shit I've ever read in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. I, <laughs> I, I, just, I could not believe, like, that's like the dopiest thing. <laughs> like, why does it even have to be millions of miles away? I mean, it is, like, 
this is this is known fact, and but like it ignores all kinds of this book ignores all kinds of like previously established canonical stuff. So why couldn't they just be like, oh, Kessel's near Endor or whatever? Yeah, they like it's just like it's in the same solar system. Who gives or whatever nearby solar system? Anyway, whatever. So, uh, calamari. It's millions of miles away. But anyway, so Trioculus is interested in it, of course. And one piece of the debris apparently is too big to move, but Dunwell did an X-ray on it. <laughs> Funny, uh, and it revealed like a hand-like shape. Could this be a glove? Anyway, Ugh. only one glove was known to be totally indestructible. Known, the galaxy-wide, to be totally indestructible. Definitely, we know the galaxy is always a, tit- a titter about any indestructible gloves. <laughs> and they would never, ever think to use the same material that made the indestructible glove to make other things. Truly baffling, so... Uh, they head to the valley immediately. Tri- Trioculus is impressed with the submarine that they're going in, and and Dunwell like mentions he's like I destroy it myself before letting it fall into the hands of the rebels. So that you know, who knows? Anyway, so Luke and Akbar, meanwhile, they send all the info about Sheev's son. Uh, and the meeting that happened at the stadium to, back to Mon Mothma, and now they can focus on the real issue, the wallet, whale So, 3PO and R2 are restored also to their original form, if you guys remember from all the way at the beginning of the book. Uh, that, so, uh, Akbar shows them the whale graveyard, and... Uh, but then they notice Dunwell's sub. They see it which is sucking up all kinds of, and more Whaladons, including Leviathor. And so, they, they, they're heading in a mysterious direction. There's no more uh, Whaladons in that direction, according to Akbar. He's like, where are they going? And we all know, of course, they're going to get the debris. <laughs> this book is tedious. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, they're following them, you know, and they notice some debris, and, and Akbar's like, I'm going to arm scoop some of this debris, and they, they analyze the debris, and they realize it's from the Death Star. And uh, the, and then as soon as they realize that, Dunwell's ship stops, and a smaller vessel exits, and Luke's like, oh shit, something's about to go down. And it approaches one of the large pieces of debris. They, so obviously they're getting there. The glove of Darth Vader is near. Chapter 6, 10 Minutes to Self-Destruct. <laughs> so, in this chapter, Trioculus puts a scuba suit on, and he goes out into the frigid waters of Calamari. He uses some sort of thing. He uses a thermal detonator to blast in the hole, a hole in the side of this long chunk of Death Star, and he peeks inside, and wouldn't you believe it, there it is. The glove of Darth Vader. So, meanwhile, as all this is going on, off in the distance, away from Captain Dunwell's sub, is Luke and Akbar and the droids looking on. Luke obviously knows what's going on here, but they are defenseless. Akbar claims we can't do anything because of the proton. Uh, torpedoes on uh, Captain Dunwell's ship. We are defenseless. Meanwhile, Luke could have, because there's something that goes on in this book that we haven't addressed yet. The fact that there's barely any use of the Force in this book, it gets used a little sooner in a, in a little bit, but there's been no, hard, there hasn't even like hardly been any mention of the Force in this book. So, well, this book couldn't have Luke couldn't have Luke just used the Force to lift the chunk of the Death Star up? Of course yes. he could have. And like, but like this is do something. This whole book is strange in its relationship to the Force. You're right about that. The prophets of the dark side, all this stuff. It's like the Empire is this, is depicted in the original trilogy as like they don't. Most of those people don't really buy into the whole dark side thing. That's an Emperor Invader thing. 
Yeah, like, like they don't know that Sheev is a Sith Lord. They don't believe that Darth Vader's ramblings about uh, the Force are anything. But this that's, book, that's why Admiral Mahdi got choked out in that boardroom. If this book just treats <laughs> like the dark side, like it's an entirely like this this separate entity that's just in league with the Empire, that's like whole crew of these prophets of the dark side. It's very goofy. So anyway, they um, they watch as Captain Dunwell's ship sucks up four Weladons, including Leviathor, and then out of nowhere, oh my god, a giant squid, and they're trying to get away from the giant squid, and then Akbar sub and the squid get sucked into Captain Dunwell sub. So now we jump ahead, Trioculus returns to the sub. He's got the glove on. He is the all-powerful. As he's walking, so this whole meatpacking plant, or the sub, is um, run by the Aqualish, is how you say yeah, it? Yeah, um, Also known as Walrus Men, a.k.a. Ponda Baba from the Cantina. And they're just sitting there playing Sabacc. And Hissa sees them, and they're just like, what are you doing? Get your asses up and bow before the new emperor. And they're just like, screw you, we're busy. In this moment, Trioculus will not take any of this bullshit. He is the supreme leader. He lifts his hand with the glove to choke this walrus man out, and nothing happens. <laughs> what? Darth Vader, all Darth Vader had to do was raise his hand, and he was choking bitches out left and right. Nothing happens. So then he has to pull out his force lightning and, sh you know, he turns the man into a pulp is like what they say here. That the man turns into like a, a pile of mush. <laughs> um, Very violent. It is super violent, but there's something fishy going on here, if you ask me. <sighs> so anyway, Trioculus is steaming mad. They go into Captain Dunwell's quarters. Um, it's Hissa and EDM, or whatever the hell the droid's name is, who never speaks. MD5. And he's MD5. MD5. So, uh, hang on, let me get here uh, where I was. So, this is where we figure out what the hell is actually going on here. Trioculus is not the son of Sheaf Palpatine. He is a plot by the Moths to gain power of the Empire because the Emperor's real son, Trioculus, tri tri Triclops, just tri straight tri up Triclops, who also has, <laughs> straight up who also tri has three eyes. <laughs> Fucking infuriating. I, I, that made me so mad. Like, Trioculus is already a terrible name, but the real guy is Triclops. Triclops. So, Triclops also has three eyes, but he's apparently a lunatic. They fear that if they were to actually put him into power, it would be the end of the Empire as we know it. So they have, I guess, locked him away, and they found Trioculus, and he's got three eyes. This will work out perfectly. <laughs> so this whole thing is a ruse in order for the Moths to gain full power of the Empire. Basically, Trioculus is just a figurehead, and they're the real uh, uh, puppet masters of this whole thing. So, and we figure out he only has Force Lightning because of implants in his hands. And until, they say this in the book, until he masters the art of the dark side, if he uses the Force Lightning too much, he can't, he'll absorb it into his own body and it could potentially kill him. Yeah, and... So, <laughs> this is a mess. <laughs> and then the droid... The droid takes the glove and puts these little uh, supersonic sensors into the gloves. So whenever Trioculus raises his hand, it'll send a supersonic noise out that will cause eardrums to burst and brains to be scrambled, thus causing the person to fall on the floor. So basically something approximately like a force choking. Not really. Yeah. Uh, this is... <laughs> I okay. know. I know. All, this I whole know. like reveal is so clumsily handled. Like it's just like 
we know you're not really like it, it, it's not like there's no mystery to it. You never suspected that he was. There's no like going back, even going back through the story. There's no hint really that he's not. I guess other than uh, it was maybe there was like one, but like I mean, I think it's vaguely foreshadowed by j- just the circumstances under which he came to power. Uh, it, it, it all seems uh, rather suspicious because there's you know he presents no evidence that he's the emperor's son. But yeah, you're right. There's nothing explicit, and there's just no build to that reveal. <laughs> It's just like it's just very poorly structured. Every like everything about this book is very offhand. Uh, just you know, sort of just journalistically reported, <laughs> without any sense of drama, uh, suspense, uh, foreshadowing, payoff of any kind. All right. Are you kidding me? We're it's ten minutes to self destruct. Come on. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, the titles are kind of so, suspenseful. The Seven Words of Trioculus. That sounds pretty cool. <laughs> and then it's... Oh, it was so cool. <laughs> <laughs> seven Words were awesome. Just like the glove of Darth Vader. All right. It's the Seven Words you can't <laughs> do on television. Sh- George Carlin, get out of here. <laughs> These Seven Words are replacing those. They're that dramatic. Okay, moving along. Captain Dunwell's hanging outside his headquarters, and surprise, he's got his office bugged. So he hears this whole conversation between Trioculus and Hissa, and he is just like, oh my god, what do I do with this information? It's just then Luke enters, and Dunwell, in without a moment's hesitation, whips out his blaster, fires, and shoots R2-D2. And then that's when Luke busts out his lightsaber and rips the blaster out of his hand. And he mind tricks uh, uh, Captain Dunwell to help them hook on to the master computer. Remember how R2-D2 was just shot? Well, R2-D2 apparently suffered no damage. <laughs> R2-D2 hooks up to the main computer, no problem. And Captain Dunwell is like, haha, but you'll never be able to break through my secret coding of my computer processor. And that's when R2-D2, uh, bloop, that zeep, you know, I'm paraphrasing, of course. <laughs> um, R2- R2-D2 says to him, uh, apparently, oh, R2-D2 cracked your code. It was even easier than Darth Vader's code on his Star Destroyer. And I, and he, f- he went through that in four minutes or something like that. We all know like Darth that. Vader did his own coding. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And no, also, if we're thinking of the grand scheme of things, what this book is not, R2-D2 hung out with Anakin for years. He could have figured it out, no problem at all. Yeah, I mean... Moving yeah, on, though. <laughs> Anyways. So, so Luke, Luke orders R2 to release the Waladons and then set the self-destruct, and he sets it for ten minutes just so the Waladons have enough time to escape. Moving on, chapter Wait, seven. Oh, hold on, I gotta mention this too. Uh, if we're talking about like the strange logistics of this chapter, things like you know R two D two getting hit with a blaster bolt and being fine, I, I found it very strange that when Luke disarms uh, Captain Dunwall, uh, he uses instead he doesn't use the force to take the blaster out of his hand. He hits the blaster with his lightsaber thus disarming the captain, which I feel is a very strange and inelegant maneuver if he's uh, trying to do anything besides maim the guy. Well, they, again, we talked about how there's like no relationship to the Force in this book, practically, despite it being called the Glove of Dark Vader and being about the prophets of the dark side or whatever nonsense. Uh, Luke barely uses the Force. Like, this is right after Return of the Jedi. He's like, on his way to becoming the most powerful Jedi ever. Um, <laughs> so anyway, chapter seven, the captain's reward. Trioculus, he, con- he he shows up and he confronts our heroes and he uses his, you know, bullshit force lightning uh, despite his, his warnings on Luke and like, and Luke, you know, he, he collapses. Uh, I'm sure shades of, of Sheev there, of course, nothing in the writing to, 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 about that because there's no character work in these books anyway so um uh trioculus he uh, he gets distracted somehow like it, it's, it's very vague how he gets distracted and he stops 
doing the Force Lightning. I don't even understand spatial relationships of characters to each other during any of the uh, fight scenes or whatever that are described in this book. It's complete nonsense. He gets distracted or something. Luke starts to run away, and Trioculus starts kind of chasing him. Luke easily gets to the transport where Akbar and R2 and 3B are already waiting. Akbar navigates them easily out of the ship, and they, they see Leviathor leading all the Whaledons home. It's like, no problems. <laughs> and so uh, Trioculus, uh, he, get, he runs after, and he gets to his escape sub with two minutes left. And MV5, uh, MV5 and, uh, and Hissa are there. Hissa. Hissa indeed. Hissa. Uh, Dunwell arrives. Uh, also, shortly after, and Hissa is just like, you can't come on before the leader of the Empire, Trioculus. And uh, Dunwell like gets pissed. He's like, is he really the leader of the Empire? Like, is he really like this guy? Nice try. Like, let me on the on the on the escape pod. And so uh, he reveals way too much of what he knows. And so Hissa is like, you know, man, it's imper- not Hissa. I'm sorry, Trioculus. He's like, tell, he's just like, it's Imperial custom for a captain to go down with his ship. It's like, oh, hard. Tri- it's actually one of the few, like... It's pretty hard. It's yeah. kind of a cool, hard moment. Uh, anyway, so Trioculus, you know, he, uh, he points the glove at... It would have been cool if he just left him there. Like, if they just do, went away and let him drown, you know? Or whatever, like, die and explode. And but of course they have to display the power, the new power of the glove. And Trioculus points the glove at him, and he presses the button or whatever the fuck, and it emits the sound wave, and it makes it explode or some bullshit. Anyway, so the villains are successful. They escape with the glove. Trioculus, he feels triumphant. Trioculus, triumphant. <laughs> anyway, our heroes they head back to Yavin Four and report to the Senate and Spin, of course. And Akbar invites them back to Calamari right away, uh, along with Leia, who wasn't there, of course, to see a Whale of concert. And while they're there, he's like, and Luke's like, this is a beautiful concert, but he feels uneasy and unsure about whether Trioculus survived. And he remembers the last words Trioculus said to him, I shall destroy you, Skywalker. You have my promise. So that's the glove of Darth Vader. This book, okay, it's just eighty-two pages. Eighty-two pages. I, I, it, it was short, blessedly short. Lots of illustrations, also, but oh, it was a slog. I, this book is not good. Now, I, I, I actually enjoy like older Star Wars expanded universe stuff, like kind of pre Bantam era, certainly pre-prequel, that kind of includes some older mythology. Uh, But this book feels like it's written by people who have vague memories of the original trilogy. They saw them, like, about ten years ago, and they didn't bother rewatching them. I'm sure they did. You know, don't come at me, Paul. Don't hit me with a libel suit, Paul. Or, I'm sorry, slander. It's spoken. Uh, But the... uh, but it's just, it feels like there's a lot of half-remembered stuff, a lot of weird, like, interpretations of, like, character relationships. I mean, again, Han's dream sky house, what are we talking about? <laughs> that new place that needs to be real. Oh, of course, yeah, I need to get that place. <laughs> Not... There's also a, there's also another example of R2-D2 being scared here at, on, like, the, on page 80, whenever... Um, Akbar invites them to the concert on Calamarty. R2 squeaks, Fizzbop, deoop, in a scalding tone. I'm sorry to report, 3PO said in a disappointed voice, that R2 absolutely refuses to ever return to Calamari with me. Again, this is R2-D2 being the scared one, not C-3PO. Yeah, this is ridiculous. I don't understand... Like all the character relationships are feel a little bit off at best, uh, and way off at worst. This book is bad. So Dan, 
if you haven't, I don't know if you've listened to any of our episodes yet, but we had, but we have a patented rating system on this show. That so that my that was my final thoughts, and we give ratings of one to ten midi chlorians. And if you loved this book, really loved it, it can go off the charts, Anakin style. So, and we apply a different character to, depending on the level we're at. So, uh, personally, I'm going to give this book. I don't take, I don't do this lightly because, you know, I we haven't, I haven't given a ten yet. Uh, I think uh, that the, I've and I've loved some of the books we read, but I also, of course, have not given a one. But this book deserves a one. It's a Brock Chun, my guy. Brook Chun, all the way. I ag- I agree one hundred percent. This is the first Brook Chun of Padawan Library. I hate this book. I was so mad reading this book. This book sucks. <laughs> this book is so bad. <laughs> Brook Chun, all the way. One midi chlorian. So yeah, one midi chlorian for me. One midi chlorian from Levi. Will our guest go against the grain? Damn. Well, I uh, I read this book last weekend while I was doing laundry, and currently I don't have access to a washer and dryer, so I was at the laundromat. If I hadn't been stuck at the laundromat, I don't know that I would have gotten through it. It's so terrible. When you told me earlier today that Paul Davis or Paul Davids, who get his name right eventually, uh, was a Transformers writer, I was not in the least surprised. This book reads very much like the screenplay to an episode of Transformers or G.I. Joe or one of those mid to late 80s hacky toy commercial cartoons. It's, it's very, very bad, basic elementary stuff. Um, it, yeah, I, I agree with what you said about it only paying lip service to being a Star Wars novel. It's very much uh, just like generic kid sci-fi bearing the names of some familiar things. I think that's the whole reason we have a sequence of characters listing planets that you might be familiar with from the Star Wars films. <laughs> uh it's really terrible. As for a rating, uh, well, I don't think, like, Brock Chun, is that the lowest I can go? Because I don't think this book is Force-sensitive at all. Oh. Ooh. We haven't thought about this. I mean, I, we, I think one was what we thought was going to be the lowest. But, I mean, the problem is... Hang on. If you listen to Qui Gon, no, no, no. everybody is you know force sensitive to some degree. The living force, it's it's in you all know of what? us. So I think even the worst of us contains some element of force sensitivity. But so that would be one. Uh, I, hang on. What? Hang on. No, hang on. What if we do? 0.5 midi chlorian, half a midi chlorian, and we call it a trioculus. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes. Oh, man, I might have to change my rating then. <laughs> well, I mean, it would only make sense to give the rating, of tri- uh, the, the rating of Trioculus to the book in which he makes his smashing debut. Triple Trioculus for the Glove of Darth Vader. Point five <laughs> midi-chlorians. Uh, moving on, we have a couple wrap-up segments here. Normally we talk about a Wikipedia page, but... This book actually offers kind of its own Wikipedia page in the back. It has a little glossary, and I just want to read some of the character descriptions. Glossary, apparently, it's not key terms. It's also characters. It's also all kinds of stuff. But uh, I just, I love the simplicity of some of these character descriptions. Admiral Akbar, Fishman. Almost. Rebel military leader. He is a fishman from the planet California. <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's you know let's check out what 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 is the entry for well, we're just gonna go with the classic characters let's see how they describe them chewbacca who's barely in this book 
who doesn't speak in this book. Yeah, it's embarrassing, you know, especially since they write out Wookiee and uh, dialogue. I'm sure they, they they had plenty of opportunities. I don't to write a bunch of being nonsense. in the book at all. What he's in he? the very first chapter at the very beginning. He's just at the he's at the spin meeting. Oh, okay. Anyway, so Chewbacca, a hairy, eight foot tall, eh, not quite, <laughs> two hundred and five year old Wookiee who serves as co-pilot aboard the Millennium Falcon. Chewbacca, also known as Chewie, uses his strength to assist the Rebel Alliance, usually serving alongside his buddy, Han Solo. Now, these are all, like, accurate. It's just very surface level. It, it betrays the surface level understanding of the Star Wars universe that this book displays. Ten, ten to one, that all of these descriptions are paraphrased from a guide to the Star Wars universe. Well, they uh, they actually thank the West End Games editors for their great guides. I think uh, that's where all the Star Wars stuff comes from. Yeah, sure, probably. The, 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 origi- the original stuff it, that is original to this novel, guaranteed that's like all the Whaledon stuff uh, and everything that doesn't have anything to do with Star Wars. So, yeah, and uh, Yoda is also mentioned briefly. We don't normally do a Yoda syntax segment, but there's no Yoda in this book except, I think, a mention of a line from one of the movies, so that doesn't count. But anyway, Yoda is described here in the glossary as the Jedi Master Yoda was a small creature who lived on the bog planet Dagobah, where the Empire might set up a new base. (laughs) For 800 years before passing away, he taught Jedi Knights, including Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker. Eh, so that's true. So, I don't know. I think it's interesting that they There's included also- the glossary at all. Like, it's a weird thing to do. There, like, who... We have an entry for the Valley of the Giant Oysters oh, okay. in Undersea Valley on the planet Calamari that has been home of the Giant Oysters for millions of years. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's strange, though, that they included a glossary at all, like, especially with the basic, like, characters from the movies. It's like, then there's, like, a cast of characters at the beginning, like it's a play or something, like it's a program for a play. It's very strange. The whole thing is uh, odd. Uh, but it's, like, not presented like any other Star Wars book, even of its era. Like, it's, it's very weird. Uh, the book... Uh, this book was, like, kind of all over the place in a weird way, though. Like, it, it was kind of the only game in town until kind of we got to... Well, there was there's Galaxy of Fear that comes a little later. Galaxy but, 4, Fear. But... And then... And of um, course, Star Wars Science Jedi Adventures. Knights was 97. Yep. But it, this this was it. And, like, this really shows a, sharp, a stark relief how good the Jedi Apprentice books are and how bad they easily could have been. There was... There was clearly no reason... They, there was no real incentive for these books to be good. Maybe there was by the time uh, Phantom Menace came out, but clearly nobody cared about the Young Readers books at this point, because this book is ridiculous. Anyway. Okay, so for our next... For our last segment of the day, we have a ma- mailbag, and you came up with a name for this, correct, Levi? Yes. Uh, this is... Ponda's Pouch, uh, Mailman Ponda Baba here. Uh, I have some mail for you guys. Oh, boy. <laughs> we should not use that. <laughs> you should own it. It's your, it's your new bit. You're great. I, okay. <laughs> You're a great comedian. All right, I'll send, you, <laughs> I'll send you some audio bits. All right, so we should act. Okay, let's act like there's a knock at the door. Oh, there's someone at the door. Who could that be? I'll go get it. Oh, look at that. It's Mailman Ponda Baba, guys. Hi, Mailman Ponda Baba. (laughs) (laughs) Say, Ponda, what's in Ponda's pouch today? I don't know. Ponda Baba noises. What what are we... Oh, You're playing like five different characters. This bit is ill-conceived, No, no, you have to... You you have to imagine the noises there, the Ponda Baba noises that are added later. So, uh... Oh, I don't know about that. We'll see. I'm the editor of this show. (laughs) So, thanks, Ponda. He hands me a a letter, and I hand it to you, Tim. Open up the letter, Tim. Let's see what it says. All right, this letter is from Chris, our friend Chris. 
he has a question. Lando Calrissian, just how many capes do you suppose he owns? <laughs> so do we have a speculation about Lando's oh. number of capes? Sure. Um, hmm. On just about the cover of just about every Star Wars book that Lando is in, if he appears on the cover, and they're all by Drew Struzan, like throughout the entire Bantam era, he's wearing like a different color version of his same outfit from the Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, and there's a cape attached to each one of those. So uh, I am going to go with. I think he's at least got a cape for each day of the week. So I'm going to say minimum seven, maximum 20. He's definitely got more than 20 if we're going by the new canon, because he has a whole cape closet in, on the Millennium Falcon in Solo. Oh, right. So uh, oh, oh, right, okay. He's got to have <laughs> at least, I'm going to guess, 35. That's going to be my guess. Okay. What do you think, Levi? I'm going to... I want to say he has an unlimited number because there's a cape factory on Cloud City. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's true. He probably manufactures them on Bestman. He's right yeah. about this. He's like he's like the Donatella Versace of of capes. Like he, he just has them he designs them, he just has them made up. He's a very They're infinite. Designer. They all they all spin out of his mind. I agree. Thank you Chris for the saying and thank you to your to, to the dead bit that you just did. Uh, what's his name again? Oh, Mailman Ponda Baba. Ponda's yeah, so pouch. Thank you so much, Mailman Ponda Baba. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah. And, and more importantly, thank you, Dan, for joining us. You're thank our you. first guest. We're going to have you back. We may cover more of the Jedi Prince books at uh. some point, although we're going to spread it out a long time, I think. Very long um, time. And we're very excited next week. You know, uh, we're going to return to the world of Jedi Apprentice, the mark of the crown. Jude Watson, thank you. Please save us. Save us. Yes. Uh, so anyway, yes. Dan, uh, I, you're mostly off the grid, so I don't think you want to promote anything. Or, no. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, so, but thank you. You'll be back on <laughs> the you podcast. you want to go back and read some, you know, pretty you know, medium level writing about some old Star Wars books, you can look at my uh, now defunct Star Wars novel blog, The Stolen Data Tapes. You got Google that. Hopefully it's still there. Tumblr is weird about deleting old stuff. Yeah, so maybe it's not even there anymore. But, but... who knows? We'll we'll look into it. If it's there we'll send out a link to the blog. I uh, we'll have you back soon at some point, I'm sure. Hopefully we'll discuss yes. a better book. Um, but next week just me and Mark Levi. Of the Crown. We're back to it. Back to Jedi Apprentice. Back to Qui Gon and Obi Wan. Maybe Xanatos will show up. Who knows? Who Mark knows? Mark of the Crown next week. See you guys. Follow. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Join the book club. Follow us on Instagram. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Add Padawan Library. If you have a question for Ponda's Pouch, send it to Padawan Library at Gmail. Until then, the library is closed, and may the Force be with you. We have too many ending lines. That's the end. I agree. There we go. That's the end. <laughs> All right. Padawan Library is hosted and produced by Tim May and Levi Paratic. It is edited by Tim May. Our theme song is by The Astral Project. Our artwork is by Freddie Funbuns. Padawan Library is copyright 2019 by Tim May and Levi Paratic. All rights reserved.